Hello, I'm Claiborne Carson, professor of history here at Stanford University. I'm also director of the Martin Luther King Research and Education Institute at Stanford. In 1985, Mrs. Coretta Scott King asked me to edit and publish the papers of her late husband, Martin Luther King. Since that time, I've, I've studied the life and work of, of Martin Luther King, and in the course of that, I've come to understand that he's more than simply a civil rights leader. Of course, he accomplished a great deal as a civil rights leader. During the 1960s, the United States passed uh, important laws, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and Martin Luther King was in large measure um, one of the people responsible for that. But I should also say that Martin Luther King always had a larger vision than simply civil rights. He was what I would call a social gospel minister, and this is what I've learned in 30 years of studying his life, that deep down, before he became a civil rights leader, he was concerned about economic issues, he was concerned about global issues, he was concerned about war and peace, as well as poverty. Uh, so these issues were among those that motivated his entire career before he became a civil rights leader. I often say that Rosa Parks turned Martin Luther King into a civil rights leader. In 1955, he was in Montgomery, Alabama, when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus. And her actions sparked a long protest, a boycott of the buses. Black residents in Montgomery refused to ride the buses unless the seating was on a first come, first serve basis rather than black people sitting at the back of the bus. And that boycott led to Martin Luther King's becoming a, become a leader. Uh, he went to a meeting a few days after Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat. And at that meeting, he was unexpectedly chosen to lead the boycott movement. And for the next year, black residents stayed off the buses. And that was the beginning of the modern stage of the African-American civil rights struggle. Uh, during subsequent years after the success of the boycott, other people besides Martin Luther King were in the vanguard of that struggle. In particular, in 1960s, students, uh, college students, sometimes even high school students, took leading roles in that struggle through a movement called the sit-ins. Uh, what they would do was go into segregated lunch counters, restaurants, uh, parks, even libraries, and demand to be treated uh, on an equal basis, de demand to be allowed to use these public facilities. Uh, and they refused to leave, so that's why it was called a sit-down or a sit-in. Um, they would simply stay there until police removed them. And this form of protest became extremely popular among young people. Uh, so during the 1960s, the uh, sit-ins spread throughout the nation, uh, particularly in the southern states where segregation was enforced by law. And that re resulted in some changes, and these culminated in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which made segregated facilities illegal throughout the United States. Uh, so Martin Luther King was one of the leaders who was very outspoken on the need for what we called at that time Freedom Now. I was one of those, I guess it was 250,000 people who came to Washington for the 1963 March on Washington. And that was the culmination of this, this protest movement. I was 19 years old at the time, so I was the same age as many of these students who took part in the sit-ins. And that protest at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington was the largest of all the protests during the early 1960s. Martin Luther King gave the concluding speech at that march, and I remember being there when he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. And 
Like his leadership of the Montgomery bus boycott, the I Have a Dream speech became the basis for his national stature as a, as a civil rights leader. It was a great piece of oratory. He uh, called upon the nation to live up to its ideals that were expressed in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So he was saying these were the words that justified the establishment of the United States as a nation. They were written by Thomas Jefferson, but the nation had never really lived up to that. So his speech was a call for Americans to live up to those ideals. After that, the major uh, goal of the movement became voting rights. And this culminated in a march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama uh, that Martin Luther King participated in. And it led to President Lyndon Johnson introducing voting rights legislation that was passed in 1965. Now, Martin Luther King, if he had simply been a civil rights leader, he might have retired after the 1965 protest. But because he was concerned about broader issues, economic issues, political issues, issues of war and peace, he decided to continue his activism. And in fact, in some ways, he became more intensely involved. Uh, he went to Chicago and helped participate in the Chicago campaign, which was concerned about issues of segregation and housing, uh, issues about employment opportunities. Um, all of these issues that concern the black community, even in places where there was no uh, racial segregation, at least uh, legally uh, segregated facilities. So Martin Luther King, for, during the period after 1965, became much more widely known for what I would consider his visionary uh, ideas. He saw the African-American struggle as part of a worldwide struggle. People around the world were fighting for their citizenship rights, especially people in, in European colonies, uh, people who were dominated by other nations. Uh, they were fighting for the right to be free to determine their own destiny. So one of the great accomplishments of the 1960s that I think Martin Luther King symbolized was this notion that every person should be a full citizen of the place where they happen to live. Uh, that had never happened in human history. Most people had always been subjects of some other power. Um, but now they were demanding their full citizenship rights. And, and that was achieved for most people in the world by the 1960s. Now, one of the things that I've come to decide, um, you know, as I've thought about why that didn't mark the end of the freedom struggles, is that citizenship rights were only part of what we could call human rights. That is, the citizenship rights apply to the rights that you have as a citizen of your, your country. But human rights apply to the rights that you should have simply as a human being the rights that you would carry with you even if you left your country and went to another country. And one thing that I've concluded is that by accomplishing citizenship rights, uh, we have become more complacent about human rights. And I think it was human rights that was at the forefront of what Martin Luther King was fighting for uh, after 1965. He, was, he saw this in a global context, and he said that now that we have civil citizenship rights, we need to use those citizenship rights to fight for a broadening of human rights. And I think that over the last uh, 50 years, one of the things we found is that that complacency, that reluctance to move from civil rights to human rights is one of the reasons why we have movements, for example, in the United States, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, what they are protesting against is not the denial of citizenship rights per se. What they're seeing is that whatever citizenship rights you might have, they can still be denied if you can be um, shot by a policeman, 
um, without, uh, without cause, uh, or if you can have your, your human rights denied, often by governments themselves, or the people acting on behalf of governments. So I think in the, in the world today, Martin Luther King's ideas still have a great deal of relevance. Uh, what we see in him is someone speaking about the issues not just of yesterday, not just the issues of legalized segregation in the American South, but the global issue of human rights. And I think Martin Luther King made one of his greatest statements on human rights when he received the 1964 Nobel Prize for Peace. And if you go and look at his lecture that he delivered the day after receiving the prize, what you see is Martin Luther King laying out a broad agenda in which he says there are three central evils in the world. One of them is racial discrimination. And we still see evidence of that throughout the world. Uh, people of color, black people uh, particularly, are often um, denied equal treatment by the authorities, uh, but whether that be police or by governments. And we still need to deal with this issue of, of racial oppression. But he said there are two other issues that should be foremost in our agenda. The second one was poverty. He said that this is a global issue. Uh, and we've seen that that is true despite the gains of the 1960s, despite the fact that people have full citizenship rights, they often don't have economic opportunity. And uh, this is a global problem, and, and I think from King's perspective, we'll only solve it when we see it as a global problem. Uh, because poor people uh, throughout the world are always going to want to move to areas where they have greater economic opportunity, and often they are denied that, that right. The third problem that King saw was the problem of war and violence. Uh, that that often affects oppressed people more than any other people in the world. And often, in, even during the Cold War, when there was relative peace between the major powers in the world, one of the things that Martin Luther King noticed was that in many of the areas of Latin America, Central America, uh, Africa, and Asia, Many countries during the Cold War experienced a very hot war because that was where the major powers fought against each other, not, against, not by firing missiles from, say, the United States to Russia, but rather the United States and Russia having battles over who was going to dominate Central Africa or South Asia or many other parts of the world. Uh, and the victims of these wars were often people who were also poor and also uh, victims of racial oppression. So what I see in King's thought is a way of understanding these problems and the way they have persisted since the 1960s. And I see King as a great symbol for a freedom struggle that did not end in the 60s, but is still continuing today as people begin to deal with these three central issues, these issues of racial oppression, poverty, and war.